Welcome back, guys. This is our first introduction video for Crimson Vow. We're gonna be talking about all of the new and returning mechanics that we're seeing in the set. Uh, you guys have Twitch chat here to, you know, go over any mistakes or uh, things that Yanks and I might miss. Yanks is on the call and we will be doing the same ratings uh, both here on YouTube as well uh, is in article form. So if you guys are interested in that, these ratings are for limited purposes only. So it's sort of a draft sealed average. Uh, but we're not going to get into those today. That will be tomorrow's video. Uh, today, we're just going to be talking about those mechanics. And we've kind of highlighted uh, a specific card that represents those mechanics in sort of a fun way. Uh, so the first one that we want to talk about is the Volatile Arsonist. This is a three colorless red red for a 4-4 four, four, uh, human werewolf. This werewolf has menace and haste. When it attacks, it does a thing. But the thing that we care about most is it has Daybound. So this is a cycle of cards that um, depend, like what side they come in on, depends upon the uh, day-night cycle, which we have seen previously in the Innistrad uh, set. But if you're a returning player coming in for this set, you won't have you won't have seen this before. So Daybound means that if it's not day or night, it comes into play and it makes it day. So um, we're going to be flipping back and forth between the two sides of the werewolf, depending upon what day in the cycle it is. So if it is day bound, in order to turn it into night, the person who has an active turn plays no spells. That turns it to the nighttime. And you will take your card, flip it over, and then you get a sort of boost, sort of like the werewolf has transformed. And then when you are night, you can turn it back to day by playing two spells. Unlike the previous uh, werewolf cycle, this does not include multiple players playing spells. It's only the active player, which actually makes keeping track of board state, I think, a bit easier. Does that about cover it, Yanks? Yeah, I said, if you're if you're returning, if you played in Midnight Hunt, you know this mechanic. If you're coming back from Old Innistrad, Neural just highlighted the key difference from the old werewolves, that it only cares about the active player in terms of whether or not they cast spells or cast two spells. I actually like this version of Day Night a lot more than I did previous uh, in a Strahd set. My only concern and the reason I kind of wish that they had kept it the same is because now if we get to, you know, older formats or EDH, now we might have to keep track of Day Night in two different ways. And I think that that is kind of gross. What do you think about that, Yanks? Yeah, that could be problematic. It actually reminded me of the one other difference between the old werewolves and these is that Daybound and Nightbound are synced across all creatures. Like old werewolves, if you play, they would always come in on their front side, uh, or their what now we would call their day side, and then they might they would flip. But then if you played another werewolf, it would come in on its day side, so you'd have some on their back side, some on their front side. Now they are always all going to be on day or all going to be on night. So if you're playing this uh, in an EDH setting, you could have a werewolf on its front side, a werewolf on its back side, and then a werewolf who's flipping for the day-night cycle separately uh, that doesn't actually trigger the other werewolf to flip back. Like, let's say, um, you know, you play a spell and I play a spell. One werewolf will flip, but this werewolf won't because it won't flip to the actual board state day change, right? Yeah. That's it's, disgusting. It, it, can, it could definitely be... <laughs> Uh, confusing to keep track of in, in older formats like that, uh, to be sure. Really, we're mostly just talking about EDH because werewolves don't really see play. Older werewolves don't really see play in other eternal formats, but yeah, that could definitely be confusing. All right, so we've talked about uh, the returning day-night day-bound cycle. Let's go ahead and move on to the only other mechanic that we're seeing as a returning thing from uh, Innistrad, and that is Disturb. Disturb is a mechanic that allows a creature to be played from the graveyard uh, and either turns it into another creature or, in this case, something new that we're seeing in this set is it actually can turn into something else, like an enchantment. So this creature comes into play as a body, and then when you bring it back for its disturb cost, in this case that is three blue blue, it comes into play as an uh, enchantment aura. And then the key thing about disturb as well is that when it's put into a graveyard from there, it actually gets exiled. So that way uh, you can't abuse it and get to replay the card over and over for the disturb cost. Yeah, again, another returning mechanic from Midnight Hunt, but the, the key difference here is, uh, Nurgle said in Midnight Hunt, Every creature on the front side was something that was not a spirit. And on the back side, it was a spirit. In Crimson Vow, all of the front sides are spirits, and the disturbed side are all auras. 
Yeah. Um, well, not all, so right? A, there is still some creatures, if I'm not mistaken? I believe they're all auras. Oh, okay. Interesting. So um, we are just no longer having the spirits. We're only having, like, the spirit protector onto another creature, essentially? Well, the front side is now a spirit. Yes. Which is kind of weird. So That is kind of uh, weird. It's, it's almost like it's like the second phase of Disturb, right? You went from a human to a spirit, and now you're going from a spirit to something even more ephemeral. Spirity? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> spirity. Okay. Spirity, spirity, spirity plus. Um, so that's, again, a returning mechanic, guys, that we've already seen. It plays just like it did in uh, in Estrad. What is it? Midnight, Midnight, Midnight Hunt. Hunt. I almost said Crimson Hunt. I'm getting everything blurred together. <laughs> um, I was like, no, that's not right. Uh, but yeah, so this returning, you guys will know how this works unless you are just coming in, then I would definitely check out some of those other Disturbed cards as well. Uh, all right, so the next one we want to talk about is one that they highlighted extensively in the uh, Crimson Vow pre-show, and that is trading. This is sort of um, Mentor++, plus plus, right? Is that Mentor is the one we're talking about? Yeah, it's very similar to Mentor. So my understanding uh, during the pre-show, they talked about, well, Mentor was a cool ability, but they feel like there was some mistakes with it and they thought they could do it better. So we got training, which again is meant to be kind of a returning mechanic with some improvements. And so the way training works, actually, Yanks, I'll let you take this one. Yeah, so what, the way training works is when, if you have a creature with training, if it attacks alongside a creature with greater power than what it has, then the creature with training, so the savior of Allenbach in this case, gets the plus one, plus one counter. Um, the, the kind of way it works is it can only trigger once per attack, so if you, have a, if you have a one power creature with training and you attack with a two power and a three power and a four power, it still only gets one counter. Um, you know, it trains once per attack. Uh, and it checks uh, the training, it uh, checks power when it attacks. It doesn't matter if then there's a pump spell in response or after that. It's as long as the training creature is still on the battlefield, uh, at that point it'll get the counter, even if it now has greater power. I think training is pretty interesting. They were really excited about this mechanic, and personally, I liked Mentor, so this is something I don't mind seeing. It didn't seem overly powerful and limited at the time, so I think it's going to be a pretty decent inclusion, and it does seem pretty unique. Um, I, do you like it better as the mentor mechanic, or do you think training is actually the better version? I think they're just fundamentally different, right? Mentor, I mean, despite looking very similar, mentor is trying to force you to go wide, right? The mentor creature is putting counters on other things, where in this case, it's all building on top of itself. Well, you still have to be um, having multiple creatures because you need something yeah. to trigger on this. I think it's roughly the same, actually, because you need a large creature to trigger onto the small creature, or here you need... A small creature to trigger from the large creature. It's to me it seems roughly the same. I guess what I'm thinking of is the bonus you got for mentor could be spread out so that if the creature was removed, you were still left with something. Where here is if you remove it, you've lost everything that you've gained on it. Uh yeah, but I assume also like the mentor creature was bigger and it had like a bigger body, uh, which typically costs more when it comes into play. Whereas yeah. something like this, maybe um, you know, if you're removing it, yeah. You've lost the, the stuff that it came with, but you also paid a discounted cost or it had an ETB. I'm going to guess it's probably roughly the same power level, but you're right. It could be way different. Oh, power, power level wise, I, I, I have to see how it plays out. I would imagine they are probably roughly similar. I just think it's a different style. Okay. Um, all right, guys, let's go ahead and move on to the next new mechanic that we're seeing for the first time here in Crimson Vow, and that is a card, uh, an ability called Cleave that we can see here on the Path of Peril. Uh, this is a, an additional cost to a card similar to like a Kicker or something like that, and what Cleave does is it removes text from the card that is uh, represented within the brackets. So in this case, it says destroy all creatures. And then uh, with mana value two or less, but if you pay the additional cost, you can just have it say destroy all creatures. So it's a nice bonus that lets you have a more flexible spell uh, depending on how much mana you're willing to spend on it. This seems like an unnecessary way to say kicker, but yeah, it, it's it's like a very ugly looking mechanic. <laughs> like I don't know, it just looks really awkward. Uh for exactly what you said, for, for something that's effectively uh, 
it's effectively kicker. There are some differences. It's not an additional cost. It's an alternate cost, which affects things like if you give it flashback or chase it back from the graveyard or something like that. But Another thing that this reminds me of, which I actually think that this is cleaner than, so this looks messier than kicker to me, but this looks cleaner than those removal spells that had alternate uh, costs as far as the color mana you paid, uh, where that was like a whole paragraph and it was worded very strangely where it says like, you know, kill target artifact unless X was paid for the cost and then kill target permanent. You know what I mean? So like, oh, yeah, you yeah, had the, to um, read the card very slowly and sometimes you could switch them in your head. And Yeah, from Ikoria, right? Yeah, that seemed a little bit funky to me. And this seems like a cleaner way to have that sort of an ability. But also, this just seems worse than Kicker. So I, I'm not a huge fan of it, but it seems like a fine way to add some versatility to a card. You could also represent this in a split card. You could have Path to Fit Peril and Path to Peril Plus in a split card, right? We've seen mechanics like that where it's just literally two cards. Yeah, I think that's one of the criticisms I heard of this mechanic straight up is exactly what you said. Why? What's wrong with just printing split cards? Yeah. Um, and another one of my biggest concerns with this is I imagine this is going to make um, translating cards a nightmare uh, oh, yeah. because the way sentences are structured, then I can see like, you know, maybe this in German just doesn't make any flipping sense. So I feel like it's unnecessarily complicated, but here we are. It's fine. Uh, this is the new mechanic. We're going to be stuck with it for th four months, three months. Yeah, no, I had not thought about that, especially the way uh, order of order of words are often reversed in other languages. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is a quick one, guys. Hamlet Vanguard. This is, I think, now a evergreen mechanic. A lot of times when you have ward in a set, you have it in abundance, and it's not in every set. However, the last, I don't know, four sets plus, we've had one or two ward cards in each one, and this has seemed... Uh, you know, pretty common that we're going to get a creature and maybe a land or something with ward. So this will probably be the last time we talk about this in one of these introduction sets, because this is no longer something that is uncommon. This is something that we see all the time. Uh, it's just a nice little bonus to protect your creatures, sort of like a built-in uh, counter spell, you know, pay X to, uh, to cast your spell. What do you think of ward overall, Yinks? Well, first off, I think I know exactly why you chose this card. He's clearly guarding Hammy. Um, so real quick, side note, you guys are gonna see uh some streamception real fast. I'll I'll edit this out. Um, <laughs> so you know the person who does the nerd girl art? Yep. Look what he sent me. Oh. <laughs> and it was just literally followed by a message that said I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Hammy tax. He he couldn't help myself. <laughs> nice. So I was planning on like posting that uh, at some point, but yeah. I hadn't seen the spoiler. I just woke up to that message and I was like, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. Tell me, I don't know how you want me to, to start now that, for the editing purpose. Thank you, How Not to Draft. Uh, so you could start with, I, I know why you picked that card, I guess. Okay. So yeah, I, I clearly know why you picked this card for the uh, ward example, given the name, and that is clearly guarding Hammy. But to, <laughs> uh, uh, to answer the question about ward, I, I, I like the mechanic if it means they are going to print hexproof, hexproof less, which is, we have not seen as much of it. Yeah, I mean, we haven't hardly seen any Hexproof, right? I can't think no. of the last thing that had it. And, you know, honestly, it seemed like once upon a time, there was one Hexproof creature in green or something per set, whereas this seems like the new go-to, right? We are seeing one or two ward creatures, similar to, you know, the stupid horse in Fort M14, things like that. So I think that they just kind of got rid of Hexproof and changed it out for ward as far as like an eternal, lightly used mechanic. Yeah, I mean, hex Hexproof was one of the least fun, least interactive mechanics ever made. Um, I understand why it existed, but having a softer version of it that you can, you know, it still punishes you for trying to target it, but it doesn't make it impossible. Um, it doesn't just turn like a one drop into an unbeatable beater with a bunch of auras on it. Boo hoo, 
a blue player can't play his spells and, and interact. Wah. If I'm blue, it's not getting on the battlefield anyway. It's more for black and red players that are going to want to kill this thing. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, all right. The next one, guys, this is a pretty cool one and I think plays really well with the um, cards we saw in the last set. So this should make for some really interesting standard play, and that's exploit. So when the creature enters the battlefield, there could be non-creatures. Maybe there's like enchantments or something. We'll see once the entire set is spoiled this Friday. But when it enters the battlefield, you can sacrifice a creature. If you do, you get an additional ability. In this case, it is uh, a counter spell. So you can counter target creature, uh, target spell activated ability, uh, or triggered ability, which is really interesting. So it adds a wide range of counterable things and also gives you a body. So it's sort of like, in this case, it's a counter spell on a stick. And then there are other exploits that maybe if you exploit, you get to bounce a creature or kill a creature or whatever. We'll see a ton of different types of mechanics. And I think it's really cool that this mechanic can be used in a wide range of ways. Unlike, uh, let's say training, which is just pretty simple, right? You do the counter where you get the thing and that's it. Whereas this is kind of endless as far as what the possibilities are. Yeah. Um, so exploits are returning mechanic from Dragons of Tarkir. Um, in Dragons of Tarkir, it was only on creatures, although they could certainly change that in this set as we see the rest of the set spoiled. Um, I thought it was a good mechanic then. It's a, I, I'm glad they brought it back. Um, it'll be interesting when we do the set review to see what we have in terms of aura-based removal, because it weakens those things significantly. Mm -hmm. um, just providing fodder for these if you get your thing pacified or something like that. Yeah, this is really interesting, I think, more in this set, uh, in this standard cycle than it was in Dragons, because we have so many counters, um, or tokens, I'm sorry, the um, stupid zombie decayed tokens, you know, the humans are going to be going much wider, I think, here in uh, Innistrad, the Innistrad block than we've seen previously. So it's going to be a really powerful mechanic, and we saw just how powerful uh, you know, these go-wide token strategies can be, especially in Limited, when we were playing Midnight Hunt. Agreed. Now, I'm I'm glad that we are not seeing these in combination with Decay tokens, because, well, then we'd be seeing another four months of blue-black. But Certainly. But uh, that said, that's not going to save us from possibly, you know, that being a new archetype in, uh, in Constructed. True. Uh, all right. Um, go ahead. But yeah, just some other quick notes on exploit. You can sacrifice itself um, for good. the exploit trigger if you want to. Um, you can only sacrifice one creature, so you can't get multiple triggers. That wouldn't really come up too much on this card, but on some other ones it could. Um, and then the weird, a little bit weird timing on how exploit works. So when the center's the battlefield, exploit goes on the stack. If they then kill the creature before that resolves, you will not get the exploit ability you'll still get the option to sacrifice something but you obviously won't want to do it because you'll get nothing out of it if that if exploit resolves you then get the choice to sacrifice something and they don't have a chance to respond at that point yeah so the, i think the key thing there is says when this creature exploits if the creature is yep. no longer there it's technically not exploiting right correct so you it'll it's kind of a trap where you can still probably sack your thing uh because this is on the stack but then this creature is not doing the exploiting so the ability doesn't happen uh, because it's not, you know, active on the board. So I'll be curious if Arena gives some sort of a are you sure you want to do that message in those situations? Because rules wise, it should still ask you if you would like to. Um, yes. And there may be some scenario where you actually do want to. You want to get something in the graveyard for some reason. But uh, yeah, that's certainly true. Um, if it's like locked down under an enchantment spell and you have a way to recur it or, you know, that definitely makes sense. Uh, all right, so we're moving on. This, I think, is the last one or close to it. So this is just kind of a generic card to show you guys what blood tokens do. So blood token is a new thing similar to food or treasure that we've seen in the past where we have a ton of different cards that are a wide range of creatures, instants, sorceries, whatever, um, that create these incidental blood tokens. And what a blood token is is a rummage card for one mana. Unlike a clue, you pay two and draw. This is one mana to discard and draw, sacrifice the blood token. 
But a neat thing that we saw during the pre-show is that there are actually cards that interact with blood tokens that maybe eat them to gain counters or do something, which is uh, very similar to the uh, food tokens that we saw previously where, you know, Gilded Goose could sacrifice a food token to make a mana instead of the actual life gain, or in this case, the rummage effect. Yeah, um, we're starting to see more and more of these like artifact tokens between clues and blood and food. Um, it's sort of a more common thing, treasure, a uh, common thing we're seeing in more and more sets. Um, this is just a nice little bit of utility, getting to filter out a card. You know, late in the game with land, uh, it's basically one mana draw card if you have a land, dead land in your hand. Yep, or you could uh, sacrifice your disturbed cards, right? To pitch those yep. to redraw, get your disturbed onto uh, the battlefield that way. You're, you're losing a little bit of value in that you don't get to kind of two for one for your disturbs, but sometimes that might just not be all that relevant and you want the backside of the card anyway. Um, another really key thing about sort of the development of the set of Crimson Vow is these blood tokens are actually why they decided not to include madness in the set, which is something we would expect to see in sort of a red black vampire themed set. Madness would go great. And I think a lot of us were expecting to see that mechanic, but I agree with the developers that madness would be way too strong with these blood tokens. And, you know, you have to have a mix of new things and old things when designing these sets. So I'm interested to see how these rummaging tokens actually play. What do you think of them, Yanks? Yeah, I like them. Any sort of card filtering is always nice. Um, you know, curious to see if every color gets this or if only certain colors get uh, these. I mean, I would expect them to be concentrated in the vampire colors, you know, red and black, but see if they do show up in the other colors as well. Certainly. I think it's going to be a pretty interesting thing. I think we're going to see a lot of cards in the next few days as the set is spoiled that deal with blood tokens that actually don't require you to use them for their rummaging effect. So, you know, similar to, let's say, uh, the 2-1 two, for 2, that if you have 5, it makes a dragon. We're seeing a bunch. I'm bad with names. Oh. It gets the treasure dragon into play really fast. Oh, starts with um, a B. No, I don't. Chat, save me. <laughs> it's a dwarf. Magda. Magda, yeah. Okay, so it starts with a B through me. <laughs> it is part of the name a B? I feel like it is. <laughs> Chat, playing a charades, Pictionary, whatever, <laughs> with Nerd Girl, because I never know card names. So I think we're going to see a lot of, mecha uh, a lot of uh, mechanics similar to what a Magda type ability would do, but with blood. Maybe not like a dragon, obviously, because that's yeah. not really on theme. But it's like, if you have a vampire, it's like, eat a blood token, get a plus one, plus one counter, or whatever the case may be. And yeah. I think it's pretty interesting, and there's a lot of possibilities they can do with this new token I'm excited to see. Yep, and you are correct. It is Magda Brazen Outlaw, as ah. Chad is pointing out. So you do have a B in there. I thought it was Brazen Outlaw Magda, maybe. I thought it was started with a B, uh, but okay. yeah, I don't know. I'm always like slightly off just enough to like make the game hard for you guys. <laughs> um, yeah, one, one other uh, fun note. Uh, we were talking about this the other day. Our girl with blood tokens is uh, unlike most tokens, these can be pithing needled. Uh, and the reason for that is because blood is in fact a card name. Pithing needle requires you to name a card, so you cannot name treasure or clue or food. But since blood is a card you can name it and it would currently at least as the rules stand it would turn off blood tokens which i think is something that would be amended um i can't imagine that that will stick but i don't know how relevant it's going to be blood tokens seem uh less relevant than let's say a food token or something like that from what we've seen so far but that is definitely a cute thing to note yeah it's it's more just of a, a cuter something that could show up at some point in an EDH game somewhere or something, although I imagine you have a more important target than blood. I think Needle just needle. was reprinted. We could see that in Standard. We could. <laughs> That's definitely, uh, definitely a thing that might happen. Um, so real quick, guys, we have a little bit more time to talk about it. I think that's the last of our new mechanics uh, and returning mechanics. So I want to talk a little bit about Innistrad, Midnight Hunt, and what we can expect to see or what we think we will see moving forward with Crimson uh, Vow. I think the general idea that, like, you know, it's a werewolf theme set, then we have the vampire theme set. 
you know, werewolves weren't very strong, at least in limited <laughs> or in constructed for Innistrad Midnight Hunt. Do you guys think we will expect to see something very similar here with vampires where maybe they will dial them back for fear of the theme set being too powerful? I, I wonder if I could definitely see that because I'm, I'm just, I, part of what I'm torn on is what exactly the timing is on development. Mm -hmm. I could also see that it go the other way if there was enough time to make changes after they saw how terrible werewolves were <laughs> in Midnight Hunt and not wanting to repeat that. I don't think there's enough time. Like these sets, I, are, I think, are made like yeah. a year plus in advance. I think these are already probably being printed by the time because there was only two months in between. Yeah, sets. this one being so short, it probably wasn't enough time. Like I knew there would, there would definitely not be enough time to redesign things, but I didn't know if there might be on a normal on a normal set release, not with the two months like this, time to like tweak a number here and there or something. Maybe. Uh -huh. um, so the, probably the, not. The running joke is that here in uh, in Estrad, right, we're seeing. Uh, the werewolf set having zombies be the most powerful thing. So now I'm thinking, you know, the vampire set, clearly humans are just going to be whew, far and away the best thing in limited that you could be doing. Now that makes sense because we've got cards like Thalia and also like Kaya. And we have like this weird thing, which we saw during the preview um, that Wizards did for Crimson Vow, where they have a ton of these human characters that are coming in, they're slaying the vampires, they're slaying the werewolves, and they're really adding this like third dynamic to to the power struggle of the flavor of the set. And that's really interesting. So I'm wondering if humans might just kind of hit it out of the park in this particular set. Certainly could. Um, Thalia in particular, I think, is 100% in the set as a foil to Alrin's Epiphany. Uh -huh. I think that's a mistake, but here we are. <laughs> They're adding uh -huh. power to... The only thing that already beats Epiphany. Like, it doesn't need the help. I mean, I'm, I'm glad it's coming, right? Uh, maybe, maybe it makes white so much better than Epiphany that it will lower the value for Epiphany to actually be in the field, and that might open up that mid-range mid deck in standard. But I still think we needed something else that, you know, the, the green and the red needed help. The white really didn't, so I just thought that was really interesting. Yeah, um... I mean, I think it's aiming at Epiphany, and it's also just convenient, right? Because Thalia is a popular character from Innistrad, so it's an easy reprint. Um, but no, I agree, that is not the color that needed the most help here. A, a little bit of a flavor, I think it would be kind of cool to see Thalia be a bit of a flip card. Because we do have the Transform cards that are not Day-Night bound, they're like humans or whatever that do actually flip or change that don't turn into werewolves, yep. that we saw in the um, Midnight Hunt. So that would have been a pretty neat, flavorful thing, but yeah, that's it's not not happening in this one. Yeah, it would be it would be nice to see for the first time in a while some sort of mid range strategy actually being good. Uh, it seems to be either hard control or hard aggro lately, or combo to some extent. <laughs> so it looks like, interestingly, we're not having any sort of like color pairing shifts, which typically when we have sets like. Um, guilds of Ravnica type things, then we have these like, okay, here's these five guilds, and then here's these five guilds. We're going through with the exact same color pairings that we saw in uh, Midnight Hunt, and that is the Rakdos, the Gruul, the Simic, uh, Selesnia. Am I missing one? And is it? Is it is the other one. So we're getting the exact same color pairings, so that bodes interestingly for standard that i think that's just going to further cement the decks that are currently good with you know us getting more is it cards um i, I don't know how much that's going to matter but we are going to be playing a very similar uh, archetype to what we were playing last time um yeah i mean i th i think as opposed to the ravnica sets at least the last set nothing you weren't hard locked into five like you were there with all the gold cards um, now you were almost hard locked into playing blue because it was too good, but because um, you had like blue white was good, Demir was good. Um, but yeah, I mean there were some missing. I guess you didn't really see much in the way of Simic or Golgari in the last set. Yeah, I mean I played a little Golgari and I I liked it well enough, but I thought Simic was probably even though blue was arguably one of the best colors. 
kind of underwhelming. I didn't see the Simic decks perform very well. No, agreed. Agreed. Yeah, there wasn't a ton of Simic. Um, Boros was almost non-existent. Same with Selesnia. Uh, we do have a question here from chat. It says, when Crimson Vow comes out, how will that change the standard rotation? Currently, nothing will change. We're just adding cards to the pool. The way that rotation for standard works is they keep adding sets until they get to a certain point, and then they cycle out a bunch of sets, and then they keep adding more sets. So we are kind of in that set buildup, and standard is going to get deeper and deeper for, I think it's like a half, is it a year? And then we get this rotation where they remove half the back cards and then start adding fresh cards again. I think that's right. Does that sound right, Yes. Yanks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, um, uh, so once we'll have, we only have five sets in standard right now. This will be six. Um, so you have Zendikar Rising, Kaldheim, Strixhaven, uh, AFR, Midnight Hunt, and then Crimson Vow, and you'll get Kamigawa and Streets of New Capenna. Uh, yep. and then after that, which I believe is Dominaria, the first four will all go away. Yes. So we're so doing up to eight and then up to eight and then four will rotate out and then we'll get four new ones rotating the other four out yeah. and then four new ones so you know your standard will always be between four i guess always between five because it won't rotate until the fifth one comes out so it's five yep. to eight sets is uh is how that's going to work yeah um and it's typically the fall set so in this case midnight hunt is when rotation happened right the four previous l drain and yeah those sets all left um so it's it's in that fall september ish window that when you get a new rotation uh morning wood i think it is uh five to eight sets because when the ninth set comes out that's when the four cycle out so you'll never have nine sets in standard but very close Um, all right, Yanks, anything else you wanted to touch on before we end our introduction video to Crimson Vow? Um, no, I mean, still still looking to see the rest of the set the next few days. Um, there, there does seem to be some power in this set, some powerful reprints that have been downgraded in rarity, which I think are interesting that we'll talk about. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll see. I'm, I'm glad, to, glad to get a new set, the... Uh, Mono Demir format was getting a little old. <laughs> yeah, Demir. I had a couple other good decks, but they were pretty far and few between. This is all actually the uh, in night, Midnight Hunt is the fastest I've ever been bored with a set. Now, I know that it's been pretty mixed reviews. Some people actually really liked it and some people really didn't like it. I'm not sure why. This is probably the most polarizing set we've seen, but it's definitely been the one that I've had the least amount of fun with. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Generally, the formats I dislike are formats where I don't like the gameplay. I don't actually think the gameplay in this format was that bad. It was just repetitive. Because you were always drafting and playing the same thing and playing against the same things over and over again. I agree. Um, I actually really liked the mechanics. I liked all the cards. There wasn't anything that I didn't like about the set as far as um, like some sort of crazy dream trawler or an archetype being... Oh, you know, whatever. It was just that they were so imbalanced that it made it very repetitive. And I just, I could not handle it after I think day two. I was like, can we be done now? Yeah, it's just like, oh, look, I'm taking a uh, Diagraph Horde again. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just far and away above the best thing. And especially as a content creator, I don't want to be posting the same two color archetype decks every day on YouTube. So I was like, I guess I'm going to force this thing that I know is substantially worse than something else I could be doing. So. I, I mean, I did, I don't know the number, but it has to be at least 50 drafts of this format, and I literally never drafted Celestia, not once. Yeah, I think I did once, just like, because I, I forced it. I, I drafted Boros once. I drafted, I don't think I drafted Simic at all either. Like, and that's, you know, 30, theoretically, that should be 30% approximately of your format, 3 out of 10. And <laughs> Yeah, it was and, but, definitely nothing exciting. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, so we will be going through, um, this will be posted on Friday. Uh, so if you guys are watching this on YouTube, starting on Sunday or Monday, you guys are going to be getting those set reviews. We will be going every, sorry, we'll be going over every single card in Crimson Vow, uh, Wooberg order and giving it a rating between one and five for limited gameplay. And then shortly thereafter, a few days later, we'll be doing the uh, text version articles on cool stuff. So you guys can look for those if you uh, would prefer to have them active while you're drafting. 
Um, and then also, you know, give me some feedback on this video and those and let me know how you think that the ratings are going to change. And then two, I'm sorry, three weeks later, we have a scheduled set review um, update where Yanks and I will kind of talk about what we've played and what has been better or worse than what we expected. So you guys will have that to look forward to. Well, um, the last thing I want to mention is for those of you guys who are going to be purchasing any Crimson Vow product for paper, make sure you guys uh, check out cool stuff and pre-order with the MNG5 code, and you guys will get the Nerd Girl Bat token that is brand new. Nobody has it yet. Um, this will be the very first time it's offered, and you guys will be the very first to get them. Hamlet is on the card, as cute as ever. So MNG5, if you guys need the Crimson Vow, uh, product. I don't get any kickbacks, so it just helps me keep my sponsorships and continue making more content. So please check that out. I would really appreciate the support. And that's it. I'll see you guys for the next video. We have a few more uh, Innistrad Midnight Hunt things to wrap it up, a highlight video and some EDH gameplay. And then starting Monday, we'll get those set reviews for you. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. I'd like to give a special thank you to those of you who have signed up for our Patreon. I couldn't make this content without you. Also to Cool Stuff Inc. and KMC Sleeves for supporting the channel as well. Definitely check them out and use our discount codes to support the channel.